Good morning. How are you all? Everybody good? How are the students? Are we okay? Yeah? Awake? Happy? I understand you're the main act today. You're all uh, speaking this afternoon, is that right? Or some of you are presenting this afternoon. That's brilliant. It's nice to be the warm-up uh, warm act for you. Um, I want to start, it's very interesting, this link between sport and education. Um, and as, as Andrew said, my involvement now in professional sport, because if you'd look at me, you can see I am no athlete. Um, <laughs> the, the idea of playing in a professional sports team died when my first stomach appeared in my teenage years. Um, but the interesting thing for me is if somebody had said to me, that as a former primary school teacher, I would be involved in professional sport. I would have thought they were crazy. And I would have thought they were crazy because as a teacher, I didn't really see the incredible power of the link between sport and education. And I hope as I uh, talk with you this morning, you'll start to see how some of that has unfolded for me. But seeing as my topic this morning is change, I thought I'd start by telling you about a conversation I had a number of years ago with one of Britain's most celebrated sports coaches. I don't know how many of you follow cycling. Uh, I don't know how many of you would be interested in British cycling. But I had the tremendous honour of speaking with Sir Dave Brailsford just after the 2012 Olympics. Now, for those of you that don't know... Dave Brailsford is the head coach, was the head coach of the Team GB cycling team that swept the Olympics in 2012. And he is also the head coach and principal of Team Sky and was the coach behind Bradley Wiggins becoming the first British man to ever win the Tour de France. And the following year, Chris Froome doing the same thing. He's an extraordinary uh, human being. And we were having dinner one night, not long after the 2012 Olympics. So Bradley Wiggins had just won the Tour de France. The British team had just won the Olympic, uh, most of the Olympic titles. Everything in British cycling was extraordinary. And he said, you know, Richard, the interesting thing is that that was easy. My greatest challenge comes now. He said, because the greatest challenge I face is the athletes are currently on a break, but they'll all be coming back to the training camps in a few weeks' time, both at Team Sky and Team GB. And he said, I know what's going to happen. What's going to happen is these incredible athletes, many of whom now are, are globally famous, they've won the gold medal, they are Olympic champions, they are the champions of the greatest cycling race on earth. They're going to come back and they're going to say, let's just keep doing what we've been doing because that's what made us successful. Let's just keep doing what got us to where we are today. And he said the real challenge is that that won't work. He said because our competitors are already redesigning the way they train and they, the way they work. And the danger for so many organizations is if you become successful, you become increasingly scared about changing what you do in order not to lose that position of success. And this is a theme that I'll be returning to through my session with you this morning. But he said two things represent the huge challenge for me. One with our athletes is to stop them believing that their coaches have the answers. One of the most important things about greatness is the ability to lead yourself. He said, and one of my great challenges is I have to get some of these champions now to believe in self-leadership. He said the other is to get this group of highly successful people to realize that change is not something that happens just once or every few years, but that actually change has to be incremental. It has to be constant. It has to be a mindset. And he said the problem really is the world now is moving so fast, and particularly in elite sport, that unless my athletes and coaches develop the capacity to constantly question and challenge what they do, 
they'll be left behind within days. And you know, as he was talking, I was thinking about my experiences with children and students. And by the way, I want to congratulate the board and everybody who's been involved in organizing this event. Because I have the privilege of speaking at a huge number of education events around the world. Very rarely, very rarely, are there students in the audience participating in the debate. Often, what happens is, and I'm talking to you guys now, middle-aged people like me roll up into rooms like this, listening to other middle-aged people like me, talking about what's right for students, and then all the middle-aged people go away and tell you what to do. Very rarely do I get to work with a room full of students too. So this is a huge privilege and actually I think a very important reason why this conference today, both in the room and more importantly over the internet, and hello to all those people around the world who are watching us on uh, screen. I'm hoping your high definition television makes me look thin. Um, <laughs> very rarely do we get this opportunity. So you guys are absolutely the most vital part of, of this conference because we can learn so much from kids, don't we think? And one of the things I often say to people is when I look back on my 20 years of working in, in classrooms, I am sure that I learned more from the students I worked with than ever I taught them. And I think we need to spend much more time really understanding kids and the way they work because what they do is phenomenal naturally. And that's where I want to start. Um, in terms of the, uh, the adults in the room, how many of you have children of your own? Can you just raise your hand if you have children of your own? Can you keep your hands in the air if you have or have more accurately survived having teenage children? Yeah. For those of you that have just put your hands down, it gets worse. Okay, just so you know, it really does. People say that to you, don't they, helpfully. People with older kids will always say, oh, don't think it ends there. And then when they're adults, they say, oh, it gets even worse. <laughs> um, it's why I travel, by the way, and I'm sorry to say this to all of you because I know you're roughly the same age as my children, but I, I have two teenage children at home and that's why I spend my life away from home. <laughs> um, <laughs> my daughter... My daughter's 19, so actually she's just left again. She's gone to university. And what makes me very proud is actually she's just finished her first year of study at university to train to be a teacher, which um, I know like your family, which has a history of education. I'm beginning to feel that we're going to build an empire to, to, uh, to match yours. Uh, you know, there's my wife and myself and my... We've got to start somewhere, but she's the second generation. So... Uh, this is very exciting, but I'm going to tell you a little story about my son because it's the experiences we have with, with our own children that I think have helped me understand the challenges that we face and how remarkable young people are. And one of the questions I'll be exploring with you is where does that remarkable ability, that born ability of all children, uh, disappear to, right? So my son is 15 years of age. And like many 15-year-old boys, he is obsessed with his Xbox. Uh, I'm looking around the room now, looking at the students in the room, going, yes, that's me too. Uh, he has his Xbox. And in particular, his big obsession is FIFA. I don't know how many of you, he is now obsessed about FIFA 16 coming out. He's already told me that I need to put down the deposit to make sure he gets the early edition because apparently it comes with a whole set of special tokens. I have no idea what he's talking about, right? But he's a typical 15-year-old boy. And you know that I'm not talking to you because you wouldn't understand this. Um, you noticed how 15-year-old boys lose the ability to speak normally to adults. Have you noticed this? It actually happens. It's a remarkable thing. It happens between your 12th and 13th birthday. You go to bed on the night before your 13th birthday, the night before you become a teenager, and you're eloquent. You say, good night, mummy. Good night, daddy. I love you very much. I'll see you in the morning. Sleep well. I will. And they go to bed like normal human beings. The next morning, something transformative happens, a bit like the Incredible Hulk. They wake up the next morning and their body changes shape immediately. And then what happens is they lose the power of speech. So the next morning they come downstairs and you say, good morning, darling, did you sleep well? And that's how it is then until they're about 17, right? So... <laughs> 
And also what happens a little bit later is, and I'm sorry to be biological about this, but teenage boys' bedrooms start to smell. Um, and they go through a phase, right? When they start to be teenagers, they smell like horrible cheese, right? By the time they get to about 14, 15, and they've discovered girls, their bedrooms start to smell like deodorant. In fact, the entire house starts to smell like deodorant because my son in particular had not realized that you don't spray an entire can of deodorant on yourself every morning, right? But it's a better smell. Anyway, he comes home from school every evening. Uh, he goes up to his bedroom and he plays on his Xbox and FIFA. Now, he puts his headphones on and he's got the headphones with the mic. He doesn't like to be disturbed, um, which means when it's time for dinner, we can't call him from downstairs. So my wife and I, because the chemical mix in his bedroom is so deadly, and I truly believe that adults should not be exposed to that kind of chemical mix too often, we take it in turns to go to his bedroom to tell him it's time for tea. And on one particular, this fateful night, it was my turn. I went up to his bedroom, knocked on the door, never expecting a reply. It didn't come. So I walked in and stood just inside the door. And sure enough, he was on his Xbox with his back to me, facing his screen, playing FIFA. Right? And I didn't disturb him because I know what he's like if I make him lose a game. It's, uh, frankly, he'd be awful all evening. So I'm still there. And you know how sometimes you walk into a, a room and there's something happening and it, everything takes a second or two to come into focus. So I could see that he was playing FIFA. But it took me a minute to realize that he was talking a lot to the person on the other end of whoever, you know, whoever he was playing with. But the remarkable thing was he wasn't speaking English. Now, this is remarkable for a number of reasons. One, because we are English. And as you know, English people don't speak anything other than it. Well, we do, actually. Um, we are multilingual English people. What we do is we just speak slower and louder in English. <laughs> but that means we can communicate in every language on earth. It's a truly remarkable talent that we possess. Um, so it's not like Andrew had been learning a particular language to learn how to speak it, right? Um, in school, he's learning to speak uh, German and Spanish. But in English schools, in state schools, he's not learning to speak those languages. He's learning to take exams in those languages, which is a very different animal, right? But the really remarkable thing is, he was speaking Russian. Now, I'm stood there for a minute thinking, is this just the toxic fumes in the room that have made me hallucinate? Am I, is this really happening in this world, right? Anyway, he finished playing his game. He came off his computer, and I'm stood there in complete amazement. You know, I'm stood there looking at my son, and my jaw is on the floor. And all of a sudden, I've become a teenage boy, because all that's coming out of my mouth is, <laughs> and he said, yes, Dad, duh, I'm learning to speak. I can speak Russian. And I'm, how did that happen? He said, oh, he said, I've been playing with Sergei. Um, Sergei lives in Moscow. He said, I've been playing with Sergei now on FIFA for about a year. We connected online and we've become friends. And he said, so we've been playing FIFA together for a year. Um, he said, when we started out, um, and he blushed a little bit, he said, you know, we decided to make the experience authentic. We should teach each other how to swear in each other's languages. I know, I know it's appalling. It's appalling, isn't it? No one ever would think of doing such a thing. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> He said, I was teaching him to swear in English, and he was teaching me to swear in Russian. He said, but we got that pretty quickly. He said, but the thing is, as our relationship has developed, we've just, you know, been teaching each other key phrases in our own language, and it's gone on.